Uh, yeah, just when I'm ready. I'll see. Good evening. Welcome to Shore Bible Church South, and that's the name of the church ministry. I'm Pastor Arthur Johnson. I want to thank you for joining us for another study in God's Word. Let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace with hearts of thanksgiving. Thanking you for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanking you for the salvation we have through the shedding of his blood at Calvary's cross. Thank you, too, for your word around which we gather to study. That which is able to make one wise unto salvation. That which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray for listening ears and believing hearts. And we pray when all is said and done, it'll be to the glory and to the honor of your name and to our ratification. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good evening, good evening again. Um, we're going to continue our study in the area of um, spirit, soul, and body. And the basic reason for doing so is to have a knowledge and an understanding of how uh, the Christian life works. Um, put that on there. Do not disturb if you have to do that. Still on? Okay. All right. Um, but as I was saying, um, we're dealing with the subject of uh, the anatomy of man. And our reason for studying the anatomy of man was, again, to have a knowledge and an understanding of how, I could say how life works, but we're particularly interested in how the Christian life works. Mm -hmm. um, and in that regard, we've been talking about the last week or so about the subject of true spirituality uh, in that regard. Now, I want you to take your Bibles, go, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And if we're talking about true spirituality, I want you to see a contrast in these verses, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. Because sometimes when you talk about spirituality, and we're not just simply talking about spirituality, we're talking about true spirituality. But sometimes the, the word spirituality is used without that qualifier that is true spirituality. In Ephesians chapter 2, there's another spirituality um, that must be taken into account. In verse 1, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now there he's talking about those who have gotten saved, but looking back at their past condition before they got saved. They've been made alive, they've been saved, they've been quickened, 
but they were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, what does he have to say about the lost man? Wherein in time past, you what? Walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There's another spirit. So when you talk about spirituality, you need to be exact, you need to be precise, you need to uh, be real clear about what, what, what spirituality you're talking about. In this case, we're talking about true spirituality, and therefore that implies that there is a false spirituality. Um, another spirituality, that may be another way to talk about it, that governs our walk, that, that is associated with the walk. Now, whether you're talking about saved people or lost people, whether saved or lost, you have a walk. And again, when we talk about true spirituality, we're talking about a walk that is after the Spirit of God, walking after the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Okay? When you're talking about another spirituality, a false spirituality, uh, one that is governed by the course of this world, governed by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, again, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, verse 2 is clearly describing lost people, okay? We're not talking about saved people who may be disobedient when you talk about the children of disobedience. The children of disobedience are just that. They are lost, okay? Um... If you look over at Deuteronomy, I mean not Deuteronomy, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 5. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man. Now watch the wording. Who is an idolater? Okay? That's the state of the individual being described here. Who is an idolater? That's their being. They have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and have got lost people have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Okay? Verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh what? The wrath of God upon who? The children of disobedience. The wrath of God is going to be poured out upon who? The children of disobedience. Now you notice he distinguished the saved man from the lost man in the next verse. For ye were, what, sometime, or once, darkness. But now are ye light 
in the Lord. Walk as, so he's talking about two distinct categories of people. He's talking about lost people, and he's talking about saved people. Now, only saved people, and I'll come back to this a little later, uh, have the capacity or the ability to be spiritual. Okay, that is true, true, uh, well, when we talk about being spiritual, we're talking about walking after the Holy Spirit, following after or walking in the Spirit, walking in the Holy Spirit. Okay, but I wanted you to be aware of the fact that there are two types of spirituality. There's a true one, there's a false one. Now, walking in the Spirit. Now, what we're going to do now, we're going to set aside for the moment this false spirituality. And we're going to focus on true spirituality. But with regards to true spirituality, there are two different aspects of true spirituality, and we talked about this last time. Now, true spirituality, again, just to be direct, is walking in the Spirit or walking after the Spirit or being led by the Spirit. That's what true spirituality is, being led by the Spirit of God. Uh, to be a little bit more exact. But there's two aspects of that. There's walking in the spirit according to Acts 2, 4, Acts 1, 5, and Acts 2, 4. The way that is accomplished. Look at Acts chapter 1. In verse 5, we have the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, during the gospel, by the way, before we look at Acts 1 5, get John chapter 7. The gospel of John chapter 7. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, look, here's what the situation was at that time. In verse 38, well, let's start at verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of what? The Spirit, which they that believe on him, what? Should receive future. This is not something that had come to pass in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? And he tells you why they, he, 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 he predicts what the future holds for them that believe on him. He says, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. They hadn't received it yet. For the Holy Ghost was what? Not yet given. And why hadn't the Holy Ghost been yet given? 
because right. that Jesus was not yet glorified. Mm -hmm. Now go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Now in John chapter 16, beginning at verse 1, These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when... The time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me. Now, remember what John 7 said. The reason the Holy Spirit hadn't yet been given is because Jesus had not yet been what? Glorified. Glorified. Now, if you look over at chapter 17 and uh, verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, this is before the cross. Now, on the cross, he cried, what? It is finished. Mm -hmm. So you have two dimensions to the works of Christ. One had to do with his earthly ministry, and the other one had to do with what was accomplished there on the cross, uh, his death on the cross. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was before it before creation began there existed this eternal relationship between the father and the son we talk about this when we talk about the trinity the godhead that there's this divine relationship that exists apart from creation itself and is not dependent upon creation but now go back to 16 I just wanted to highlight the issue when he says, for he had not yet been glorified. And so when, when he talks about the fact that he had not yet been glorified, meaning that he had not been crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended back up into heaven to be with the Father. Okay. It would not, the Holy Spirit would not be given until that happens. And this is what he's describing here in John 16, uh, verse 4 now, John 16, verse 4. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. Now watch, but now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you asketh me whither goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I what? That I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, a reference to the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you and when he is come now 
go back to Acts chapter 1 in verse 5, Jesus again, after his post-resurrection commission, reminds them of the promise about the dialogue that, by the way, we just read in John 16, about the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now, this promised coming of the Holy Spirit, this giving of the Holy Spirit, is said to be a baptism with the Holy Ghost. Okay? Is said to be a baptism with the Holy Ghost. In verse 8, it's an endowment, an endowment with power from on high. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Okay? So if you go over to chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, so the time had come, the time had come for the fulfillment of the promise of the Father, about the giving of the Holy Spirit. Before we read that, I want you to look back at Ezekiel real quick so we understand the full extent of this promise. And Ezekiel 36 We're going to start at verse 23. I'll tell you what, let's go back to verse 21. Ezekiel 36 and verse 21. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do this, I do this, I do not this, brother, for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. Now, that speaks of an unconditional promise. Wasn't based upon what Israel did or didn't do. It's an unconditional promise that God is going to do himself in spite of Israel's condition. Verse 23, and I will sanctify my great name, which was profane among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God. When I shall be sanctified, now watch, in you before their eyes. By the way, when you, you, you think about, you remember our, our, our uh, text verse, the verse we started out with first uh, Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. God sanctify you, what? Holy spirit, soul, and body. The idea there is God being sanctified in the believer. Now, in this instance, he's talking about being sanctified in the nation of Israel. But when we're to, when we're over there, when we're talking about true spirituality, that's the essence of it. Uh, 
God shall be sanctified through the believer. Okay. And it is a testament, testimony and a, and a witness in the world. And in this case, Israel is supposed to be a witness to who? To the nations. Now, Israel fell miserably in being that witness. And rather than God's name being uh, glorified, they caused the name of God to be blasphemed against. Notwithstanding that, God is going to be glorified in Israel in spite of himself. Again, that speaks to the unconditional nature of, of what God is, how God is going to do this. So in verse 24, for I will take you from among, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Now, who's going to do this? God's going to do this. Okay. Um, you know, you got a lot of the prophetic pronosticators looking at events today and how political matters are often changing and swiftly changing. But the People who don't acknowledge the interruption of the prophetic program see these things as God working to bring about the kind of fulfillment of a promise or a prophecy as what we're reading about God bringing Israel back into their land. Mm -hmm. And so they look back at, what, 1948? Mm -hmm. yep. When Israel was established to be a nation again mm -hmm. and all of that by the way was the machinations of the um, United Nations mm -hmm. that wasn't God mm -hmm. doing that mm -hmm. okay that's that's what I'm trying to say here mm -hmm. and when you fail to recognize the prophecy program that's having been interrupted you're forever going to be on this path of, on this course of trying to see the prophecy being fulfilled. You're always going to be searching and looking and trying to make everything that happens in the political world a fulfillment of prophecy because you don't believe the prophecy program has been suspended, has been interrupted. And God is not working to fulfill the prophecy program. Again, Romans 11, 11, and 12, what does it say? I say then, have they stumbled, who? Israel, that they should what? Fall. God forbid. But rather, through their fall, what? Salvation is come unto the Gentiles. Now, if the fall of them be the diminishing, I'm sorry. Yeah, for if the fall of them, rather the diminishing of them, I say, if the diminishing of them means the, the their fall, let me just paraphrase what I'm trying to say, results in blessing of the Gentile. In other words, Israel has been concluded in unbelief so that God will have mercy upon both Jews and Gentiles without distinction. Israel no longer had their covenant position. Okay. God has cast them away. So God is not, so 1948 could not be God fulfilling his promise to the nation of Israel. That had nothing to do with God fulfilling his promise. For I will take you from among the heathen, and going back to Ezekiel 36 and 24, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Now, this is yet future. Okay. Then we'll, but notice what happened when, when 
when this was supposed to happen. Then will I what? Sprinkle clean water upon you. Now, my reason for pointing this out, I wanted you to understand. Um, being God being sanctified in Israel. When we talk about God being sancti being sanctified by the Spirit, uh, we're talking about, again, glorifying God before the world. Manifesting God before the world. Okay? And what that means when this promise of the Spirit, the giving of the Holy Spirit was the means by which that would be accomplished. Israel couldn't do it in and of themselves. Now, that was the reason God gave the law. Romans 3.19 Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And so God, I mean, so in Romans 10, uh, or Romans 6 rather, Paul talks about you're no longer under the law but under grace. Romans 10, he talks about for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. And by the way, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes, again, in Ezekiel 36, 23. The issue there is holiness and righteousness. And a spirit-filled life The manifestation of it is holiness and righteousness, okay? But that can only be achieved, that can only be accomplished by the Holy Spirit. And so in verse 25, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all of your filthiness and from all your idols, Will I cleanse you? A new heart also will I give you. And a what? A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Now, well, let's read down just a little bit more. And, I, and, and ye shall dwell in the land. Now, this is God's promise to who? Israel. To Israel. Yeah. And what I have to say here is important to keep this in mind, the, the connection with the land, okay? Mm -hmm. um, when we begin to talk about the Holy Spirit and um, our walking in the Spirit, our walking after the Spirit, what that means for you and I today in the dispensation of grace. But in verse uh, 28, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn, and I will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. But you can begin to see the promise is not just simply a spiritual promise. It's a promise that result in, in physical, material blessing. 
for the nation of Israel. But those physical material blessings are going to be fully realized, won't, won't be fully realized until the day that the nation is filled with the Holy Spirit. But that giving of the Holy Spirit, that being baptized with the Holy Spirit, I wanted you to see the, the nature of it, the extent of it. It is to be led and guided and governed by the Holy Spirit, resulting in a, a walk of holiness and righteousness. Okay? And my point is that there, there are two distinct ways in which being filled with the Spirit is accomplished. The one is to be baptized with the Spirit, and that's what we're reading about in Acts chapter 1, 5, Acts chapter 2, and uh, verse 4. And so when we talk about walking in the Spirit today in the dispensation of grace, we're not talking about Acts 1-5 and Acts 2-4, okay? But rather we're talking about Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, and Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through two, one and 2, in Romans 6, in verse 17. Walking in the Spirit today is not Acts chapter 2, in verse 4, in, ver in chapter 1, in verse 5. But rather, walking in the Spirit today is Ephesians 5.18, mm -hmm. Colossians 3.16, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, and Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. So let's take a look at each one of those real quick. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. In Ephesians 5, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be what? Yeah. Filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. The parallel to that in Colossians, by the way, Ephesians and Colossians are books probably written pretty much contemporaneously. And they follow a similar pattern in topics and subjects. The ideas are very similar, very, are parallel to one, one to another. So in Ephesians 5.18, you read, be filled with the Spirit. Parallel to that in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, is let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So when we think of being filled with the Spirit today in the dispensation of grace, it's not a result of having been baptized with the Spirit, but rather letting the word of Christ do what? Dwell in you richly. Now, if you look back at chapter 2, Colossians 2, that's the consequence 
of having sound doctrine built up in the mentality of your soul. This is not something that is automatic, but requires the act of studying the Word of God. Okay. It, it, is, it requires the act of putting yourself in a position where you can be taught the Word of God by studying the Word of God and building that information up in the mentality of yourself. So in verse 6, as you have therefore what? Receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so what? So walk ye in him. It began with you hearing the word of God. It continues with you hearing the word of God. But now notice in 7, it's not just uh, an act of hearing that's in, involved here, but an act an act of being taught the Word of God in a very systematic way. Rooted and what? Built up in Him and what? Established in the faith as ye have been taught. You see that? As ye have been taught. Now letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly cannot happen without you being taught the word of God. Okay. Um, Verse 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy in vain to see. And it's not just being taught anything. Okay. Beware lest any man spoil you through what? Philosophy in vain to see after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. There's a lot of that being taught in the churches today. Not just in the world, but a lot of that is what's being taught in the churches today in the name of Christianity. Mm-hmm. Philosophy in vain to see, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and what? Mm-hmm. And not after Christ. Philippians 1.27 says, only let your conversation what? Be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him. So being filled with the Spirit today in the dispensation of grace is not the result of having been baptized with the Holy Spirit, which results in an automatic filling with the Holy Spirit, which automatically results in true holiness and true righteousness. The way that is achieved in the believer's life today is through the intake of sound doctrine, letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, a great way to think, you notice that, by the way, that it's not the words of Christ, it's the word of Christ. A more... A work, an I, a, a systematic idea of doctrine. You know, 
And, and, and when you think of that systematic idea of doctrine, a system of doctrine, um, a verse of scripture you ought to incorporate in conjunction with that verse is Romans 16, 25, and 26. In verse 25, Romans 16, 25, Go ahead and take a look at that. He says, now to him, verse 20, now to him that is of power to what? To establish you. And how is God going to do that? According to my gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to what? Revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God and the wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. But when you talk about let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. is taking the Pauline design for the edification of the believer and building that information up in the mentality of your soul. The resulting consequences of that is holiness and righteousness. Look at 2 Timothy for a moment. And I know my time is up, so I'm going to just kind of wrap this particular thought up, and we'll continue next week. But Second Timothy, time go by fast, fast, fast. Second Timothy, chapter three. Verse sixteen and seventeen. Watch. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is what? Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for what? Instruction in what? In righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Being, that, being filled with the Holy Spirit today are the consequences of studying the word. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, what? Right. Rightly dividing the word of truth. All of it's to be studied. But if you're going to realize the true profit from your study, you have to rightly divide it. Okay? But our being filled with the Holy Spirit is achieved, is obtained by the intake of sound doctrine. Now, there's, there's a verse you want to Keep in mind so that there's no mistaking about how the holiness and the righteousness or being instructed in righteousness, how righteousness is produced in your life and in my life. Go to Romans chapter 10. In Romans 10... And verse uh, verse ten. 
For with the heart, man what? Believeth unto righteousness. Now you can build all the sound, you can build all the information into your heart, into your system. But like Paul told the Galatian, having been made perfect by this, by this, no, having been. Say again. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. He says, Galatians three, verse three. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Okay. My point. That's Galatians three and three. And my point is, building sound doctrine in the mentality of your soul, the purpose in doing that is so you know what to believe. And when you believe it, it's not you, but God. Philippians 2.13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Okay. So I'm just explaining further the, the idea of what it is to walk in the Spirit. You have to take God's Word in. But the catalyst or the activating of it all is by faith. You believe it. And 1 Thessalonians 2.13 when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, that what? Effectually worketh in them that believe. Okay, any question? All right. I appreciate the distinction that you're making between the false the spirituality and the true spirituality because I could, you know, if you're in a denomination and you read that, yeah. <laughs> and you're, of course you're thinking, well, oh, my denomination is true spirituality, whereas once you write it by the Bible, that's why grace message is so humbling because you, you thought you knew something, and then you see the grace message, you see, you yeah. actually knew nothing. And that's why the testimony of so many people who've come to see the word rightly divided. Mm. Uh, it's not that they didn't know Bible, they didn't right. know verses. Yes, they knew scripture. They knew scripture. Yeah. They just didn't understand it rightly divided. Right. And it's that key that unlocks the word of God. Because without it is is confusion. Mm. And it's frustrating. Uh, because you're trying to believe everything. Yeah. And you can't. Yeah. Um, well. Yes. Understand. You must understand. That is a, a yes. very powerful word. Yes. The understanding. And recognizing that there are true, different truths. For different times, mm -hmm. for different people. Yep. Now you may be reading about a truth at a different time yep. for different people, but if you interpret that or make the mistake of saying mm -hmm. that applies to me, yep. that's where the error mm -hmm. comes in. Yeah, the contract was made with Israel. Yes. So you know, God gives a contract with that yes. people. And if you if you lay claim to that promise and it doesn't work, God doesn't keep his promise, yeah. then what are you gonna think? It's just fairy tale. Mm. It's just a myth. Yeah. Christianity isn't real. Yeah. You know, that's where most people go. Yeah. I mean ultimately that's where they go. And then those who are just you know, you take the the, the, the truly genuine, genuine, simple person mm. who just wants to believe God yeah. but is being deceived by evil men and seducers mm. 
Um, you know, when it don't work, they don't blame God for it. They just chalk it. You know, they, they develop some gimmick, some superstition to try to help God out. You know. <laughs> It's amazing, and you can see it on the. It's amazing that it's the words on the page that actually there on the page have been totally ignored. That they're actually there, and that's what we're talking about. What is true spirituality? Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, it's following God's word to you. Yeah. Yeah. And just keep saying it. Yeah. All right, brother Bob, we'll see. Yes. Close this in the word of prayer. Yes, most gracious heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you once again. That we need the one true living God of the universe. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and when he died on the cross for our sins and buried and rose again in the gospel of the grace of God. Thank you for seeing us given by the risen Christ to and through our apostle Paul and his epistle of Romans. Confirming them, and they put trust in that the words said here today, and that you will help people to understand, to know where they are along the timeline for the, uh, for the dispensation of grace that is now operating through the proper parameters, and, and not try to think of themselves as Israel, but see themselves as separate and distinct members of the body of Christ, the covenant kingdom program. And after the rapture, God will be back to Israel program without missing a step and will finish up with the kingdom on the earth. We thank you for that revelation, for understanding, so our inner man is built up and that we glorify it. And we thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.